I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. In this episode, you'll meet historian Harold Holzer. In his new book, Presidents vs. the Press, he recounts the often hostile relationship between the media and U.S. presidents originating with George Washington. During this program, part one of a two-part interview with Mr. Holzer, he details stories of presidential frustrations with the press from our founding to the dawn of the 20th century. Historian Harold Holzer, we were talking before we got started taping that this is book number 54 for you, The Presidents versus the Press. Tell me about its thesis. Well, um, I wanted to explore the relationship between chief executives and the journalists who have covered them, praised them, kept their secrets, exposed their secrets, and generally um, antagonized them. Uh, I wanted to trace back the origins of the disputatious relationships that we see on our television screens almost every day. Uh, And also, uh, I wanted to do it as a follow-up to a book I put out five years ago about Lincoln and the press, and just see how it all fit in as a possible continuum of uh, difficult relations, strained relations between the presidents and the press from the beginning. How did you select which presidents were included? Well, I mean, I dreamed of doing everybody, but I realized uh, that it was impractical and might be pretty tedious. I mean, I know we're all dying to know about James Knox Polk and the press, but um, or Benjamin Harrison. But I decided um, to, to cover the founding era uh, with Washington, Adams, uh, and Jefferson, a skip to Andrew Jackson, who really was a, a major influence uh, and precedent setter on relationships with the press, take a new dive into Lincoln, uh, and then uh, go to the uh, 20th century presidents and on, of course, into the 21st. I left out some of the 20th century. I left out Coolidge. I left out Harding. I left out Hoover. So I would say, uh, and, then, and then after Kennedy, it was everybody. I would say that I, it was really a personal choice. It was the presidents that interested me. I thought readers would certainly want to know about everyone whom they might remember from their own lived experience. And that's why I included presidents who served only briefly like, uh, uh, like Jerry Ford. Did you have the opportunity to talk to any presidents in your research? Well, I only asked two. Um, I, uh, I guess this is a backstory. Uh, I asked uh, George W. Bush and I asked Bill Clinton. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't want to overload it with with the spin that presidents might give on their experience with the press. I also, by the way, stayed away from living press secretaries, and there are an abundance of them. I just really wanted to dwell on um, on the record of briefings, press conferences, and perhaps their own. Uh, immediately published memoirs. But President Clinton was generous enough um, and thoughtful enough to provide answers to some of the questions that I wanted to raise with him. So I think these may be the first comments that he has made about uh, one of those fraught you know, eight years that any president ever experienced with journalists. I guess I feel the obligation to tell people that you and I have known each other for a long time as we're going to spend two hours together uh, on on this subject matter since 1994 when we we C-SPAN did its first big Lincoln project, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and we've worked on many since. So uh, I will uh, not call you Harold throughout, even though I know you in that off screen, but um, it's delightful to to have you in this context uh, for the next couple of hours. I wanted to, uh, we're going to survey presidential history during our two programs with you. But I wanted to jump to the punchline. I mean, I'm guessing that you were inspired to this uh, subject matter by our current president, the incumbent president, and all of the sparring that he's been doing and the big criticism he makes all the time of the fake press, the fake news media. So what is the punchline? As you've done all this research, is Donald Trump's relationship with the the press the worst ever? No. Um, as much as I thought I would confirm my own suspicions as a citizen watching all of the chaotic 
briefings and press conferences and tweets that it was the most disputatious. I think it's part of a long tradition. And I think beginning with Washington, Adams and Jefferson uh, on to Lincoln, uh, certainly um, complicated relationship with FDR and uh, Nixon uh, was certainly had a worse relationship with the press. He just didn't uh, harp on it daily and didn't have the they didn't have the technological means to harp on it without going out and confronting the press. So this is presidential tradition. Several presidents um, emerged from my research saying almost identical things. Uh, fake news or false news, that's not a new construct. And also reminding their own staffs periodically, the press are not your friends. Uh, we are at odds. We have that is the classic relationship. Don't get too chummy with journalists. Sometimes press secretaries had to tell presidents that, but often uh, clever presidents told their staffs that. So twas ever so is what I discovered. We just have uh, more access to the complaints than we've ever had. And that's because really of technological innovations. Is the relationship between presidents and the press in the United States different than other countries because of our First Amendment? Oh, yeah. Um, I, we are absolutely freer here uh, than, than in, in any country that, is, that has autocratic rule or, uh, or dictatorship or unelected presidents. Um, and, and the reason, as you mentioned, is the First Amendment uh, and the great fighters for the First Amendment, uh, one of whom Floyd Abrams figures in the book. He gave me a, a, an interview and I used some of his published writings. He has pushed back against quite a few presidents who, who have pushed against the edge of the First Amendment. That's not to say that presidents have all respected the, the constitutional provision that Congress shall not uh, interfere with freedom of the press. They have gone around it in several different ways. They've passed and signed legislation. They've simply said, we're in a war, so we can't pay any attention to it. They've employed secrecy to eavesdrop and later to punish. Uh, so uh, the First Amendment is out there, of course, as an ideal. But more than one president uh, has done his best to push back and really push the limits. So your book was originally scheduled to come out in the springtime, delayed by the pandemic. What has it been like publishing during this year? Well, it's, it's frightening. And um, uh, I don't know whether there will be an audience uh, for, for this book or really any book in this period. Uh, I'm heartened by the fact that it's appearing uh, between, uh, you know, at convention time. So we're all more attuned uh, than we were several weeks ago to the countdown to election day and uh, to presidents' relationships to journalists and the media uh, during the campaign and during their White House occupancy. Um, I guess the thing that makes me saddest is uh, missing all of the events that I'm used to having when a new book comes out with you know, live talks and book signings. Um, I, I, I think I'm gonna miss book signings uh, very much because you get to talk to readers and um, chat about their interests. And, and frankly, you never know who you're going to meet on a book line. I've met descendants of people I've written about on book lines. I've met long lost relatives. Um, I've met people who, who have an idea that I hadn't thought of that I, I like to pocket and use the next time I write. So that's, that's going to be tough. Um, but again, you know, we're all here and uh, doing well, and that's about the most we can ask for. I think all readers look forward to the day when they can hear authors in person again and stand in book yeah. lines, for sure. So I'm going to start our survey conversation with John Adams because it's an interesting history. But before we get into him, is there anything that people should know about George Washington setting precedents in relationship with the press? Yeah, I think so. Um, Washington um, is, the, is the beginning of the two beginnings of my book. I use him in both the introduction and, of course, chapter one, because he's the first president. And I was uh, surprised to learn, frankly, because my, 
not my period. I've, I've gone back in time and forward in time to, to do new research. But Washington, the, the, the great universally revered figure, uh, became less so in the final year of his first term. And then all through his second term was subjected to the first uh, episodes of deeply partisan journalism. And frankly, he was horrified, annoyed, hurt, angry. And I found several episodes where he uh, threw newspapers to the ground, jumped and d up and down on newspapers, ripping them up with his boots, uh, yelled about getting subscriptions he didn't, uh, he didn't want. And meanwhile, uh, the, the anti-federalist press, which by the way, was imported into the capital of Philadelphia by Washington's own Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, who not only helped create the opposition newspaper from within the cabinet, but funded the editor, gave him a job in the State Department so he could afford to be a newspaper editor of a fledgling enterprise. Uh, and then Washington found himself criticized for um, stealing money from the Treasury, for indiscretions during the French and Indian War, for a lack of patriotism during the Revolution, all sorts of charges that were unimaginable uh, against the early Washington. And when he wrote his farewell address, he drafted a paragraph later cut by his editor, Alexander Hamilton, that made it clear that one of the reasons he was not standing for a third term was that he could not take the imprecations, as he put it, of newspapers any longer. He thought they were displaying to the world that our union was fragile, and he had enough. John, Ad John Adams is described in your book as cranky, never got over hurts and resentment, and lacked charm. How did this impact his relationship with the press? As you can imagine, he did not charm reporters, although, or editors, who were more important. But at the beginning, he had, I guess, the first, if you don't count Washington's adoration at the beginning, Adams had the first press honeymoon, uh, a phrase that came into the vernacular much later. He was shocked after making his inaugural address um, in 1797 that Republican newspapers, that is the anti-Federalist newspapers, applauded him. The Federalist newspapers from his own party were not quite as excited. And the reason apparently was they wanted to give Adams a chance to be more pro-France than George Washington was perceived to have been. That was their big criticism of Washington that he was too pro-British. Uh, Adams was really not deceived by that early flattery and quickly it became very partisan. And uh, the Republican press went after Adams and the Federalist press was tepid about him, which really doomed his efforts for reelection uh, in the famous uh, race against Jefferson in 1800. You write that the prescription for his frustration with the press was always regulation. What did he do? Well, he signed one of the most um, uh, ill-advised, uh, anti-democratic, and unconstitutional measures in American history. Uh, the Sedition Act, part of a package of repressive bills to limit immigration and also crack down on journalistic criticism. It actually made it a federal offense for a newspaper to ridicule or hold to ridicule the President of the United States. Uh, there were large monetary fines, there, was, there were prison terms threatened, and it was not just a toothless warning. The Adams administration went after Republican journalists, fined them, imprisoned them, uh, one of the most famous being James Callender, uh, a pro-Jefferson editor, who was imprisoned in a, a Richmond jail for five or six months and fined about $500. For, for criticizing John, Ad John Adams. And this was a horrific time in American history, at least in American press history, the, uh, the worst abuse of uh, constitutional guarantees ever and ever again. What was Adams' rationale legally for signing the law? Well, I don't know if he had a legal rationale. He had a political rationale. Uh, and the political rationale was that criticism that was libelous did not fall under First Amendment protection. Um, he found uh, a, a stark opposition, of course, from the other party. Thomas Jefferson denounced 
the Sedition Act. And frankly, one of the reasons he prevailed in the next election was the bitter taste that was left by the Sedition Act. But interestingly, Jefferson didn't oppose the Sedition Act because he believed in absolute freedom of the press, though his words would leave you know, a different feeling. He opposed the Sedition Act because he just didn't believe the federal government could overreach on anything legislatively. When he became president, libel actions continued. They were just bumped down to the state level. So uh, you write that John Adams conducted 17 show trials during the election year, 12 of them against publishers and printers. Why were they simply show trials? I think he was, I think the, the, the purpose of the trials was not simply to silence, but was uh, to silence the accused, uh, but to silence the broader group of, of uh, anti-federalist newspaper editors who he hoped would be chilled uh, from further criticism that he deemed to be personal by these trials. Keep in mind, one of the big uh, Jeffersonian objections to the Sedition Act, aside from the fact that he felt it was a federal overreach, was the fact that all of the judges that were in place were Federalists, because all of them had been appointed by George Washington and John Adams, and that meant appeals courts and the Supreme Court. So the Republicans argued, and I think with, with uh, strength on their side, that the courts were stacked against them. Uh, but Adams definitely wanted the, the show trials to demonstrate that the government was indeed going to crack down mercilessly. So the signal, you know, they were sending a message. How did it work out for him? <laughs> well, he goes down in history as uh, perhaps the most uh, uh, anti-press freedom president ever, although we'll be surprised as we go on chronologically to learn who else joins him in that uh, you know, that, that category. Um, he also called for, he was the first to call for a state-run news agency, uh, which has an autocratic air to it. He wasn't the last, the most recent is the most recent president, to get news out that was state-sanctioned. Uh, so I guess Adams left with a reputation as being repressive, um, uh, thin-skinned, because again, this is all about criticism and how he reacted to it. And um, the, the Sedition Act sunset when Jefferson became president and was never, never again rekindled. Although the measures that it, that it legislated were later revived by Lincoln, by Woodrow Wilson and others. Abigail Adams was one of the early outspoken first ladies, unusual for the time. Did she support John Adams in this effort? Absolutely. I mean, she was 100% um, uh, his advocate and 100% joined with him in writing uh, really angry letters about press critics. Um, can, I, can I go ahead to Jefferson to give one example? Of sure. Mm -hmm. Abigail? So uh, one of um, Adam's chief critics was a man that I think I mentioned, James Callender, who, um, as we can discuss in a moment, later turned against Jefferson, after criticizing Adams and going to prison, turned against Jefferson. Abigail had a wonderful series of letters uh, with Jefferson in which she basically said, I told you so. He was no good. You embraced him. You paid the penalty. And Jefferson protested, no, I never authorized him to be libelous. But in fact, uh, he sowed the whirlwind, Jefferson did. And Abigail chuckled at the fact that it came back to bite him. Well, moving on to Thomas Jefferson, you write about him. Under the system that Jefferson helped create, newspapers became participants in, not just observers of government. What, what did you mean by that? Well, the first episode goes, went back to the Washington era when he, um, he funded uh, a fellow named Philip Freno, uh, uh, tilted toward French, obviously, his name was French, who had been John, uh, James Madison's roommate in college uh, he um, got him to move to Philadelphia to start a newspaper to oppose the Federalist newspapers that were pretty much praising everything Washington did. And uh, he encouraged Freno. He, he gave him a subvention to operate. And then when uh, uh, he later encouraged uh, a uh, particularly interesting uh, 
newspaper man named Benjamin Franklin Bache, uh, the grandson of Benjamin Franklin, who started his own newspaper in Philadelphia and quickly turned against George Washington viciously. He employed uh, James Callender for a while, actually. So when Jefferson uh, ascends to the presidency, he decides, uh, and since he's now in Washington, D.C., he leaves the newspaper infrastructure in Philadelphia as it is. He doesn't want to move it wholesale to the new federal capital. He wants it to stay in the biggest city in the country, Philadelphia. So he creates a new Jeffersonian newspaper in Washington. Um, and it's pledged to support Jefferson's policies. And in return, they get access to news. They get to be sort of the first news agency distributing news to other sources around the growing country, which of course grew exponentially in Jefferson's administration with the Louisiana Purchase, and was rewarded financially. Uh, Jefferson uh, and earlier presidents had begun a policy where newspapers would be given government contracts for printing of handbills and circulars, uh, government advertisements, and their newspapers would also be hired to record the proceedings of Congress. Uh, there was no congressional record until the Lincoln era so newspapers lined up for the rewards of printing the proceedings of the House and the Senate. And they made a lot of money. And of course, that is nothing like uh, money to see a loyalty among newspapers. What was the readership like during this period of time? Did people read only the press that aligned with their political thinking? And were they only reading regionally? The, it, readership and uh, is one of the great mysteries of, of, the, of the time. I mean, uh, newspapers did not publish daily for a while. Some of them started with weekly editions and then moved to twice weekly. Ultimately, they, they became dailies when print presses became more mechanical and able to churn out more copies. Uh, newspapers expanded into new territory, but their readership was small, you know, in the, in the thousands at the beginning. But there's no way really to determine with any accuracy what the readership was. So on the one hand, literacy wasn't high. On the other, and on the same hand, uh, enslaved people were forbidden from reading anything, including the news of the day. They, the teaching of reading and writing was forbidden. So that truncated the, uh, the audience. Uh, uh, the largest ever population was under 18 in the new country. We don't know if they read. And yet, now on the other hand, uh, one edition of a newspaper might be, might be shared by as many as 25 or 30 people in a, in a nuclear family. So um, it's very hard to determine readership. And to, to your other question, uh, I think my own instincts are, and people, uh, visitors from other countries made note of this through the 1840s and 50s, when they visited the United States. And that is that people were given totally different reports about individual news events according to the political party affiliated paper that they read. And European visitors often couldn't recognize the event that they themselves had witnessed when they read about it in the different party papers the next morning. Um, I think that people read the party paper with which they were affiliated and not anything else. And I think it's sort of comparable to the uh, research that we have on viewers who are glued uh, often to MSNBC or Fox, but don't flip the dials between to get different perspectives. So the, the uh, press, press has really gone through a trajectory of partisan, then moving into uh, coverage that was supposed to be fair to whoever was in office. And now we are again in an age where, at least on television, people are moving to partisan outlets. Absolutely. I, no, I wouldn't even say have are moving. I would say have moved. They've moved. They've unloaded the moving van and <laughs> they're in the house. Uh, getting the back house divided as it happens. Getting back to Thomas Jefferson, you've referenced Thomas Callender, who was his greatest enemy, also left the longest lasting damage to Thomas Jefferson's reputation. What should people know about Callender? So Callender was a Jefferson ally. He had been uh, writing for a paper in Philadelphia, really uh, destroying Washington 
practically criminalizing him in print, haunting him uh, all the way back to Mount Vernon. And then he established a, a newspaper in Richmond aligned with uh, Thomas Jefferson. And he went to Jefferson or communicated with Jefferson and asked if he could not become the postmaster of Richmond, dot, 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 in return for his support in print. Now, this was not an outrageous request. Editors were given federal jobs all the time, um, and they were rewarded, as Jefferson had done with Philip Freneau, gave him a, a job in the State Department. Jefferson didn't like the insistence with which Calendar importuned him for this reward, and he basically said no. That was really not a smart move by Jefferson, who always is the Jefferson who writes beautifully about freedom and doesn't always practice what he preaches, as we know when it comes to slavery or, or freedom of the press. Jefferson said no. Calendar immediately switched to a Federalist newspaper. Uh, and this is after he had done prison time for criticizing the Federalists. He jumps to a Federalist newspaper and he writes a pamphlet uh, in which he says that Thomas Jefferson is uh, living in sin or whatever the right word is with an enslaved woman uh, who, who, whom he owns and who is the half-sister of his late wife. And this, of course, is the Sally Hemings story that uh, has been now proven through DNA in our own century and persuasively advocated by a series of really terrific historians like Fawn Brody and Annette Gordon-Reed. But this story was put in circulation by Calendar. It was deeply destructive of Jefferson's reputation at the time. And of course, one might argue deservedly so. And that was Calendar's revenge. If there was a lesson to be learned, it was, uh, you know, hold your, your press allies close to you, especially the ones who are a little bit unstable. Uh, Calendar later uh, drank himself into a stupor and either jumped into or fell into a river uh, and died, uh, by which time Jefferson had first paid some of his fine for the Sedition Act imprisonment, and then, of course, broken with him and suffered really reputational consequences. You write about Jefferson that despite his antipathy towards the press, actually you say he came to revile the opposition press, that he never abandoned the core belief that under no circumstances could the federal government prevent newspapers from printing opinions. He, exactly. He, he, but he did encourage the prosecution of uh, newspapers under state libel laws. And uh, there was one famous case that uh, was adjudicated in Albany, New York, um, and um, um, Alexander Hamilton himself was brought in to be the appeals lawyer and was so persuasive in getting the charges dismissed or I think uh, a hung jury that New York refined its libel laws to allow for more, for more criticism. So Jefferson, you know, again, he's a difficult subject to write about, about almost anything um, because his actions sometimes speak louder than, than his words. The man who is capable of writing all men are created equal and then enslaving people um, was also the person who wrote, if I had to choose between a free press and a government, I would choose a free press. And uh, the press is the toxin of our liberty. He was a very persuasive writer about the benefits of a free press. And, and then when he was retired, he complained. He said, I never read the newspapers because, uh, except for the advertisements, because that's the only truth that you can find in a newspaper. He wrote a mock mocking uh, statement once about how to start a successful newspaper. And his first precept was, don't tell the truth because you'll never be successful. And yet he saved so many newspapers that when he and his... Uh, uh, assistants and uh, those who uh, worked on his estate donated his library to the Library of Congress. As we know, it was the core of the Library of Congress. We always hear about the books he donated. He also donated thousands of newspapers that he couldn't part with. So he was, a, a, as in many aspects of his life, a very perplexing Jekyll and Hyde when it came to press freedom. 
We're going to jump to the president you know best, Abraham Lincoln. And I have to read this because I've read it several times in preparing for this interview, uh, and it, it's so strong. He had become, by 1864, the harshest, indeed the most repressive presidential censor yet. Even Adams's Sedition Act prosecutions could not match the ferocity and scope, the undeclared, unlegislated, unlitigated, and largely unchallenged war the Lincoln administration began waging against the hostile domestic newspapers within months of his inauguration. Wow, I was tough. You were tough. Um, <laughs> you were yes. tough. Well, um, we can argue about the legality, the rationale, uh, the um, tensions and anxieties that existed when uh, the southern states seceded and started a rebellion, and that was Lincoln's argument, that in the case of a rebellion, all bets are off, and uh, he felt he was not obligated to protect individual constitutional guarantees if that meant that the entire Constitution would go down the drain with the Union. So that was his rationale. But the record is undeniable. Um, Adams may have um, conducted what I call show trials um, to enforce the Sedition Act, but at least there were trials. At least there was a semblance of procedure, uh, civil procedure. Lincoln suspended civil procedure. He suspended the writ of habeas corpus early in the war and he enforced crackdowns against the press through the military. The army closed down newspapers. The army uh, and the State Department threw newspapers uh, off, out of the post office in New York so they couldn't be mailed in the summer of 1861 to other constituents, threw them off trains so they couldn't be shipped. It was a federal grand jury that issued an indictment, a presentment, as it was called, against New York newspapers. It was a federal force that roused a, a, a Democratic newspaper man from his bed and hauled him down as a prisoner to Washington to face um, military inquiry. It was Lincoln who authorized the uh, takeover of the telegraph wires by the War Department. Um, we, we often read about, you know, and saw in the movie Lincoln, a kind of benign and humorous president who liked to hang out in the War Department telegraph uh, to get the latest battle news and to chat with the telegraph operators. Well, that was also a place where newspaper men had to go to file stories. And it was a little bit inhibiting, I would say, to go there uh, into a room that was right outside of the ferocious Secretary of War's office where the president, the commander in chief, used to hang out. Not a good way to file stories. And there were examples of editors whose stories were censored. Uh, editors who were tarred and feathered. That's not Lincoln's fault, but it was the atmosphere. And somewhere just south of 300 newspapers that were temporarily shut down, whose editors were arrested, and who were often imprisoned without the kind of trials that the Adams Justice Department provided. The, uh, you mentioned that the telegraph, telegraph and photography both were really becoming uh, uh, technologies that were widely used in society. What impact did they have on coverage of the Lincoln administration? Uh, I'm glad you asked because one of the themes of my book is uh, how presidents have used technology to their advantage. And Lincoln, uh, once the government got control of the telegraph, immediately sensed its utility. So he would write letters to critics uh, uh, and, and make sure they were published in newspapers and distributed by telegraph to the West, meaning Illinois in those days. Late in the war, when he spent much of the last three weeks of his life at the front uh, during Grant's last push against Robert E. Lee in Virginia, he filed dispatches to the, ostensibly to the Secretary of War describing the siege of Petersburg, the, the fight to take the Confederate capital of Richmond, which were then printed on front pages of the newspapers as if he had become not only a, a commander in chief, but a military correspondent in chief. Uh, so Lincoln, of course, did uh, uh, just make brilliant use of the telegraph for rapid fire communication of his opinions and his reports from the front. Photography, yes, of course, was coming into its own. Um, I didn't make much of it in the book uh, at the time, really until 
much later in the book because uh, while photography was uh, growing in uh, popularity and in ubiquity, photographs were still not printed in the newspaper. They were, pub they were adapted with wood engravings in the weekly pictorials like Harper's Weekly and Frank Leslie's. But there were still no photographs in the daily press. Uh, and uh, often they settled for battle maps, very seldom for portraits. But Lincoln did provide the models by posing through which he was, uh, became the great uh, star and the most familiar face in America through the picture weeklies. What was the Corning letter and why is it significant in this story? Well, Corning, and it's the same family that later uh, dominated the, uh, uh, the glass business in upstate New York. Erastus Corning was a Democratic politician in, uh, in upstate New York. He called a convention of Democrats to push back against Lincoln's abrogation of civil liberties in the view of the Democrats. Now, the administration had just cracked down on a former Democratic congressman in Ohio who had advised young men not to enlist and to resist the draft. Then uh, the Chicago Times, a longtime critic of Lincoln, a Democratic newspaper, endorsed the congressman's uh, recommendations. The congressman was arrested by the military and tried and convicted and expelled from Ohio. Um, the Chicago Times was closed. Its newspaper editor, its editor was arrested. Um, and although Lincoln later approved rescinding the measure, this is what the Corning Convention raised. And they wrote a very bitter public letter to Lincoln denouncing him as a dictator. So Lincoln wrote a letter to, uh, as he put it, Erastus Corning and others defending his administration against charges that he was violating the Constitution. And it is a brilliant letter. And he makes a convincing argument that um, he has to prosecute these cases or the union itself will be destroyed. So what is the point of project, protecting press liberties and the, uh, the right to speak in public against the government if it causes the fall of the government itself? Was he justified? Um, it's still debated in law schools and in Lincoln forums and assemblies. But as he memorably said, must I shoot a simple-minded soldier boy who deserts and spare a wily agitator who induces him to desert? And Lincoln believed that it was a mercy to go after the wily agitator. Um, and he was... He just believed that recommending that soldiers not enlist, that they desert, that they resist the draft was treason, and he treated it as such. Uh, this caught my eye in the chapter that you, uh, through your research, you say, unnoticed by other historians, that his continued crackdown on the press uh, it went on even when winds seemed inevitable. Yeah, I was surprised to find some episodes very late in his presidency after he won re-election. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, was, it was consistent. The policy was consistent. Uh, and um, really up to the time of his death, there was an e editor who had been exiled, I think, to Canada, who was railing against his uh, assault on press freedom. I would say, I mean, um, I, I think there is, a, I, I should add, there is a case to be made that uh, Lincoln acted in the best interests of the country, albeit violating the First Amendment uh, when he believed the Constitution was under threat. But I find it remarkable that during political campaigns, he did not crack down on criticism. In fact, he just rolled with it. He encouraged his own supporters to attack back. He wrote letters to the editor objecting to criticism or slander, although he never sent the most famous uh, objection of those. He believed that uh, election campaigns were the holy grail of the American system. And uh, almost like, uh, you know, Lent, you did not do anything violative during these sacred periods. So during his, during the 1862 off-year elections, when he had to defend uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, the Republican Party took a beating. And Lincoln did not object to criticism really vile criticism of his inciting servile war, as some of the press put it, 
And uh, during his own campaign for re-election, he was treated brutally by the Democratic press, including suffering uh, um, the most racist attacks in the history of American politics, I think. Uh, dirty tricks that uh, charge that he was going to foment uh, um, intermarriage, that that was the basis of his re-election campaign, which was a little bit out of his, you know, his ken at that point. So uh, it's just surprising. He treated campaigns as open season. And I think that's to his credit immensely. Uh, the next president I want to jump to is Theodore Roosevelt. You call him the master press agent of all time. Why does he earn that in your estimation? Well, I, I will say I should say that that was a quote by one of the journalists who felt outgunned by Teddy. Um, up until Teddy Roosevelt, editors were the be all and the end all. They controlled policy. They controlled the tenor of reports from Washington. Uh, they were the ones that presidents uh, befriended, gave jobs to, gave contracts to. The Roosevelt era changed all that. Um, correspondence, Washington correspondence were more important. And Teddy Roosevelt realized immediately that he could leave the editors alone of the Daily Press. In fact, they didn't like him much. Uh, certainly Hearst didn't, Pulitzer didn't. And, and he should endear himself to the day-to-day -day correspondence. He gave them their own press room. He talked to them. He put them in his inner circle, called it the, the Sagamore Hill Club, the Oyster Bay atmosphere. Um, uh, those who violated his ethos of loyalty were uh, put into a group called the Ananias Club, named after a uh, uh, someone who had lied about St. Peter and been rendered blind. And that became a kind of a famous uh, purgatory for journalists who, who went against Roosevelt. But what he also did is welcome journalists to talk to him. Even Lincoln hadn't done that. He had two interviews maybe in his entire, his entire career as president. One of them with Nathaniel Hawthorne. How could you say no to Nathaniel Hawthorne writing for the Atlantic Monthly? But Teddy, no press conferences yet. That would be his successor's initiative. What Teddy did is every day at around one o'clock, his barber would come to the little hallway between the new Oval Office and the outer offices and give him a shave. And while Roosevelt was covered with lather, wearing a big uh, uh, apron over his clothes, he would invite the Washington press corps to ask him questions. And it was a riotous, informal scene. There are great reminiscences by those who experienced it that the reporters would sort of try to get him upset because he would leap out of the chair and they, the, the, the barber would be holding a straight-edged razor over his cheeks or his throat. And there was a game afoot to see which one of them could get Roosevelt to subject himself to a laceration by his enthusiasm. But Teddy did more than that. He uh, endeared himself to progressive long-form journalists uh, like Lincoln Steffens and Ida Tarbell and Ray Stannard Baker, who were magazine writers who uh, provide the ballast for his progressive reforms by writing about Standard Oil, by exposing the meatpacking industry, uh, by uh, uh, discussing unfair labor practices. They created uh, the, the revolution that Roosevelt then took to the halls of Congress for reform legislation for trust busting, as we now know it. Uh, we later, uh, we know these uh, journalists as the muckrakers, but Roosevelt, interestingly, who devised that term to criticize them, because when he was through with the reporter, he wiped his hands of them, and that included the muckrakers. Um, so he was a genius. He was a genius about his image, about photographers. He once uh, was going to do a, a Thanksgiving Day proclamation, and a photographer was delayed. So he simply canceled the event until the photographer showed up and then interrupted a diplomatic meeting to do it. Um, he became the darling of photographers and caricaturists. And uh, was if he didn't quite get the technological revolutions that were going on, he was just a bigger-than-life figure who was made for this transformation. And again, reaching out to journalists he liked um, and giving them access was revolutionary. You credit 
FTR with things that are very common to us today in watching relations between the president and the press, leaks, trial balloons, and swamping the press with diversionary stories. Yeah, he, um, he not only practiced them, he not only invented them and practiced them, he coined the phrase for them. Swamping, I found one of the most interesting of his techniques when someone was about to make an important announcement, he would put out a news release and, uh, and do interviews so that he could dominate uh, the front pages. And, you know, cr critics said uh, that Teddy expected to be on the front page of every newspaper every day. And when he wasn't, he was disappointed, which is probably, which is probably true. And if it sounds familiar, well, it should sound familiar because part of the ego-driven aspect of presidential um, personality uh, and practice is the idea that you're right and you should be constantly described as such. Um, trial balloons were, um, you know, issues that he would float out there to see if they were shot down or gained traction. All of these things, uh, including the bully pulpit, which he also uh, coined a phrase to describe, wherein the president would use the power of persuasion, not necessarily legislation or executive order, as we see so often today, to convince the American people of the righteousness of his cause. Famously, he invited Booker T. Washington to the White House. Did he also reach out to the black press at the time? Well, um, the, the, the Booker T. Washington event was at first a meeting. And uh, most meetings with Teddy Roosevelt um, lasted longer than the schedule uh, indicated because Teddy would do so much of the talking that the guest would have to find some time to respond. And it usually meant he was, uh, he was behind the schedule almost from the morning on. Uh, no exception when uh, the, the, the educator, uh, Booker T. Washington, arrived. And it grew so late that Roosevelt said, why don't you stay to dinner? And um, Dr. Washington did. And the press, most of the press in the North and the black press for sure, reported this as a great milestone. Now, Abraham Lincoln had had tea with, a, uh, with an African-American journalist, Frederick Douglass, who was still a journalist when he had tea with uh, Abraham Lincoln in the White House. He ran his own newspaper. But for some reason, this, and again, this is the Jim Crow era, this set off Southern newspapers and Southern senators in really vile ways. Um, um, one senator said that uh, black people would have to be lynched in greater numbers now because they would become so haughty about this social uh, advance. To his discredit, I mean, I think Roosevelt was casual about it, to his credit. To his discredit, his administration responded by first trying to deny that the dinner had taken place. And, uh, and then uh, later... Uh, taking that back and acknowledging it, but making certain to say it was no big deal. So he didn't use it as um, a wedge to widen access for African-American reporters or visitors. There was never another event of its kind again. Um, there were events in his administration when Teddy displayed uh, a genuine lack of sympathy for African-Americans, as in his infamous... Um, lack of sympathy for African, Amer African American soldiers who were rioted against in the South while serving their country in training. So it's a mixed record, but he does get credit for this one innovation. And the black press by and large liked Teddy Roosevelt, certainly at the beginning, and certainly by comparison to some of his successors. Well, our final 10 minutes is going to be on a, a successor with a personality that couldn't be, be more different than his, and that's Woodrow Wilson. Uh, you called him chilly, that he had a Socratic approach, uh, and uh, that he was sensitive to perceived insults. How did he deal with the press? Well, he had his problems. Uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, was professorial, not, not strange. He was the former president of Princeton. Um, and he also, uh, together with his staff, devised the idea for press conferences. Now, they were not what we see today in the briefings and scrums that uh, take place before the cameras at the White House almost every day. They were rather rigid affairs. 
questions were submitted in writing. Uh, Ro uh, Wilson answered the questions very formally. Uh, he got irritated with questions he didn't like. And most importantly of all, all of the press conferences were off the record. Now his manner was severe and um, the newspaper men were, had been used to a raucous, friendly, jovial atmosphere with Roosevelt, who of course had come back into their lives as a candidate for president in 1912, the year that Wilson defeated him and uh, TR successor, William Howard Taft. So the press liked uh, Roosevelt. Uh, they, uh, one journalist gave a great description of what it was like to cover the White House um, from the Roosevelt era to the Wilson era. They said it was like going from a foundry full of humming activity to a convent, kind of a cloistered atmosphere where everyone was very quiet. Now, Wilson came from a long line of newspaper men. One of his uh, grandfathers had worked uh, uh, for the Philadelphia Aurora, the same paper that Benjamin uh, Franklin Beach had founded uh, to criticize George Washington. So, uh, and, and Wilson had been the editor of the Princeton College newspaper when he was a student. And his brother, his own brother was the editor of a daily newspaper. And uh, so he, he understood journalism. He just didn't like journalists. And he particularly didn't like them when they wrote about or inquired about his family. Now, TR had been the same way, but TR had given up. He couldn't get people to stop writing about his cute little boys. And he certainly couldn't get them to stop writing about Alice, his older daughter from his first marriage, because she smoked and she rode in cars by herself and she was independent and she was great copy. Wilson did not like his daughters to be written about. And when one photographer took a picture of her riding a bicycle, he said on the record, I'd like to punch you in the nose and I can do it. When they wrote that she was engaged after he became president, he gave this, stood up and gave this rip roaring lecture about how the press has no right to invade the privacy of his home. And he would see to it that they didn't and he would strike back at them so the press said, well, can we put all that on the record? And he said, no. Uh, so again, he was a man of many anomalies. He took the press to Paris for the peace conference that uh, negotiated the formal end of World War I. Uh, the French leader, Clemenceau, who had been a journalist, didn't think the press should be there, but Wilson insisted. And yet when everyone got to Paris, he excluded them from many of the proceedings and probably this did not make the book by the way this next uh, observation because i didn't think anybody would care to know about a pandemic i mean we don't have pandemics anymore i said as i finished the book back in january um, wilson probably caught the spanish flu as we called it then uh the big influenza in 1918 in paris but he hid himself and he did not reveal uh the depths of his illness and some said he was very sick, raving, in fact, and maybe even close to death at that point. There was the first incident of a president keeping his health secret from the press. And it's one that Wilson himself would repeat, or his administration and his wife would repeat, when he had a stroke after he got back to the United States. So and we have five minutes left in our first hour together. Would you talk about the Wilson stroke and, and why reporters weren't able to get to that story? an incapacitated president? Yeah, I mean, um, Wilson simply was closed off in an upper bedroom. Uh, some reporters knew that he was seriously ill. Very few wrote about the depths of it. They wrote, some wrote that he had gone insane. Uh, they saw bars on an upper floor window and thought he had been restrained. It turned out those bars were put there, uh, put on a nursery when uh, TR's boys were small and kind of wild uh, to keep them safe. Um, word leaked out, they relied on doctors uh, giving what they thought would be true reports, You know, left it to the men of science to tell the truth, but they didn't. They all said he was recovering and his wife cloaked his activities in total secrecy. He had already during the war cut down on press conferences to a minimum. And um, it is remarkable that he was able to conceal his health difficulties. But skipping ahead uh, to our second conversation, so did John Kennedy. 
So as we close out this first period of 130 years of American history and presidents and the press, what is the most important thing to know about this period of time and how presidents dealt with the press? I think you hit on it um, earlier when you noted that uh, the press started out uh, revering presidents, one president. It moved into strict partisan mode, uh, supporting people in return for political jobs and printing contracts, and also because they believed in them. Um, and then in the 1890s, led by Adolf Ox and the New York Times, uh, reporting became more about news and less about political opinion. And uh, somehow presidents appeared to take advantage of the fact that they were newsworthy and it was not all about politics. So newspapers become more ubiquitous, they become less partisan, and they become, become more focused on news and personality. Uh, and that's the evolution we see in this first century and a half. But the, pre yeah. but the presidents, if I can quickly add, never lose their antipathy for press criticism and their punishment. And Woodrow Wilson created the Committee on Public Information to circumvent and censor the press during World War I and uh, created the biggest public relations machine that had ever been seen out of a White House in American history up to that point. And each one of the stories you told us, the president tries to circumvent the press uh, by creating their own organs or creating their own journalists who were currying favor with them. That's also an important part of the story as well, the, uh, the desire to get around the press corps. It is, and it will continue to play out uh, into the, the next hundred years of the story for sure. And as we close, since it's also a book about technology, during this first 150 years, what was the most significant advance in technology that impacted this relationship between presidents and the press? Oh, boy. Um, telegraph and telephone were certainly huge. Electric power was huge. Uh, the, the development of the steam press, which would produce thousands of copies beginning in the Civil War era by the hour. Um, I would say technologically, those were those were the key. And and don't underestimate the telephone, uh, the good old landline, because newspaper men would speak to a president and then fight their way back to the press room and, you know, get me the city desk. That was the way it was done. Get me the copy editor. The book is called The Presidents Versus the Press. This is our first hour with Harold Holzer, where we look at the first 150 years of American history. We're going to record a second hour where we bring it up to the modern day. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org with your questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.